I am Jacob Weisberg. I'm Chairman and Editor-in-Chief of the Slate Group, and I want to welcome everybody here to the Future of Longevity, which is a look ahead at how dramatically increased years are going to systematically change our life experiences, relationships, careers, and society. Uh, I want to say this is a future tense event. Future Tense is a, is a partnership between the New America Foundation, Arizona State University, and Slate Magazine, which explores emerging technologies and their transformative effect on society and public policy. Uh, central to our partnership is events like this one uh, in, in Washington, D.C., that to try to take an in-depth and as provocative as possible a look at issues that while not so well understood today are going to reshape policy debates in the decades to come. We want to thank Prudential Financial for supporting this event. Uh, like all of you, Prudential has identified increased longevity as one of the transformative trends of our time. And uh, it's a major factor in the way they're addressing their customers' needs. And we're very grateful for their sponsorship of this series at Slate. And on behalf of Future Tense and uh, Prudential, I want to thank our, our panelists, the moderators we're going to have up here today, and all of you attendees uh, for your effort in understanding and meeting the challenges and the opportunities of longevity. Human longevity is dramatically increasing. Uh, in the coming years, it seems possible that we're going to live out our extra years or decades in vitality and good health. But will we as a society be able to keep pace? In an age of rapid technological and scientific progress, our communities, our politics, and our economic institutions are underprepared for the coming challenge of longer human lives. If average human lifespans extend to 100 or 150 years, possibilities we're going to be thrashing out today, what's that going to mean for marriage as an institution, for the workforce, and for personal financial planning? What will it mean for the economy as a whole, for entitlement programs? How can we plan now for the increased human longevity that we know is coming and the inevitable impact it's going to have on society and on policy? Uh, so these are big questions. And um, they are very, very much dependent on what form longevity takes. And to get us right into that discussion, I want to introduce Joel Garreau, who is co-director of Future Tense and Lincoln Professor of Law, Culture, and Values at Arizona State University. Uh, Joel was a staff writer at the Washington Post here in this building for, for many years. Uh, he was, when, when I lived in Washington 20 years ago, he was, he was one of my favorite writers. I mean, it, he was one of those writers you looked for the byline. You didn't know what he was going to be writing about, but you knew you wanted to read it. Um, and Joel is going to take you through four scenarios that, that, are, that are different, but all, all potentially plausible uh, in terms of, of our future lifespans. Um, and uh, without further ado, please come up. Joel, thank you, everybody, and welcome. Thank you. Welcome to Future Tense. We're glad you're here. Um, what I'm going to do here for just a very few minutes is we're anticipating this morning having a very stretchy conversation about what the future of longevity means. <clears throat> but what, we want to, what I want to do right now is give you a little structure to think about this and talk about this, um, give you a little framework of four possible scenarios that we think is important about how the future might be in the year 2030, 17 years from now. Uh, less than a generation. So what we're hoping that these scenarios will do is give you a framework that you can refer to as the morning goes through. So for example, suppose you want to make the argument, as some people have, that you think that technology is going to advance rapidly, but it's not going to have much impact on health span or lifespan. If that's as, as an example. If you make anyone, an argument like that, if you could locate it in one of these scenarios and say, so therefore I think the future is going to be this scenario, then that will give us something to push off of because the object of the game is to decide what we should do today 
about this dramatic change that we're looking into in the future. Um, so with that, um, humanity's increase in lifespan may be our greatest achievement. Most of the world's children and their grandparents are, going to, are living long and productive lives. Even if you count the wretched of the earth, the typical person at birth today can expect to live to nearly 70. That's up from just her 30s in 1900. The significance of this is that you're going to have dramatically possibly different futures. What does the, what does the future of longevity hold for us? The future is impossible to predict. But if you want to create strategies today, the object of the game is to think broad about what the future might hold, because it's better, if you're creating strategies, to never be surprised by the future than to occasionally be, try to be exactly right with predictions that never work. Here's some pertinent facts on the ground about right now. First, life expectancy in the developed world has been increasing like clockwork. A quarter of a year, every year, for 160 years. Thank clean water, child mortality, vaccines, antibiotics, and so forth. That's already baked in. Second, for the last half century, the amount of computer firepower that you can buy for a dollar has been doubling every 18 months. This is Moore's Law. That's why your smartphone has more computer firepower than did the entire North American Air Defense Command in 1965. Third, the genetics, robotics, and nano revolutions are now exceeding this accelerated curve of Moore's Law. That's why the first human genome sequenced in 2000 cost several billion, and today the cost is approaching that of a comprehensive blood test. Now, those are, the, those are baked in certainties. These we know. Now, but there are plenty of critical uncertainties in these scenarios. A few examples include how will new pathologies like the obesity epidemic affect lifespan and health span? As lifespan increases, what about diseases that take on new importance, like Alzheimer's? What about the gap between the rich and the poor? Is it possible that technology will stall? We don't know. So let me introduce you to the stars of our scenarios. Uh, they are John and Ann Grant. In 2013, they are 65 years old. They're not wealthy, but they have savings, health insurance, and interesting jobs, which put them in the top quintile of American earners. And they have two daughters, Sarah, 28, and Emily, 23. Their close friends are Giles, a computer troubleshooter in his 50s, who has already had a stroke, and Buttress, a clever handyman in his 40s who is a smoker. So here are four scenarios and how it affects them for human longevity in 2030, less than one generation from now. First scenario, scenario A is small change. Small change is the official Washington future. This is what policymakers expect, typically. Uh, in small ch change, the exponential increases in the biologic, genetic, neurological, information, nano, and implant technologies have only minor impact. Current trends continue in lifespan, health span, Social Security, Obamacare, costs, federal policy. It's a straight line projection from the present. Small but persistent change whilst costs skyrocket. This is the official future. In small change, John and Ann can expect happily to work beyond 65, but in 2030, in their 80s, they're going to be dead, or close to it. Um, that's just the way demographics has worked at this t uh, right about now. And Giles and Buttress may not even be as lucky as they. Meanwhile, in 2030, Sarah and Emily are in their 40s, in a decade or so, their health spans will begin their long, expensive slide. And that's massively unsustainable by today's cost estimates. That's the official future. Now here's scenario B, drooling on their shoes. 
Anybody know J. L. Shansky? Boy, did he give me crap about this headline. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. Anyway, in drooling on their shoes, the exponential advances in the genetics, robotics, information, and nanotechnologies succeed in increasing lifespan, but they largely fail at increasing health span. In 2030, John and Ann, therefore, are already in assisted living, they, where they can expect to stay for the next 10 or 20 years. They have these long lives, but they're marked by one major intervention after another at tremendous cost. And none of these free them from their walkers and their dementia. Their lives are so miserable that suicide is now among the top five causes of death among the aged in 2030. Now, drooling on their shoes is a difficult scenario logically, but it is a core nightmare for a great number of, of the American people, which is why we have it in here. This, this scenario assumes that technology can patch up the hobbled and doddering at great cost without addressing the underlying causes of decline. So in this scenario, in 2030, even though supercomputers are now on everybody's wrists, only moderate progress has been made on heart disease, cancer, brain disease, and decrepitude. In Washington, meanwhile, the balloon is up. Congressional budget turmoil is vast. Drooling on their shoes is even more expensive than small change. And Americans in this scenario in 2030 want to know from their congressmen what they got for the trillions they poured into the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, and science in general. They want to know why they should pour more money down these research rat holes. Scenario C, live long and prosper. Live long and prosper is based on the assumption that the first human to robustly and youthfully live to the age of 150, is already alive today, and is in this room. <laughs> Think about that. Variations on this scenario are the new conventional wisdom among some sober scientists and insurance companies. Uh, in Live Long and Prosper, Google's Calico program designed to attack death, which was just announced, works. We see advances in personalized medicine, tissue engineering, organ regeneration, implants, and memory enhancement. Early interventions are routine in heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and cancer. Even as personalized medicine grows exponentially, however, the costs drop like a stone. That means that that's because medicine in this scenario has become an information technology and it starts obeying Moore's law so that you see medicine seeing the drop in the technology costs that you've seen in your smartphones and everything else in your life. Meanwhile, the very disease model of medicine is coming to an end. This is a very disruptive technology. John and Ann, in their 2030 bathroom, have an appliance called Google Medicine. It's the size of a toaster. We have a prototype of this at ASU, by the way. It, it's real. Every morning, they spit in it. The box analyzes their biomarkers and sends the information up to the cloud where today's sample is compared to all their previous reports, as well as all of the reports of everybody else using this network. So, Ann and John detect health changes weeks, months, and even years before symptoms appear. This means early, cheap, personalized interventions. The results are amazing. In Live Long and Prosper, Ann and John in 2030 are feeling more youthful than they have for decades. Sarah and Emily and their friends chatter about how many careers and marriages will fill their very long and exciting lives. But in Washington, guess what? The terror fights are going full bore. Hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of baked-in cost assumptions about aging are deeply challenged in this scenario. What does 65 mean? In this scenario, chronological age and metabolic age have become uncoupled. So saying that somebody is 65 or 80 
just doesn't mean that much. Why should, in 2030, Mick Jagger will be an 87-year-old dancing, prancing rock and roll star? Why should he be pulling down Social Security? Hospitals, meanwhile, are going the way of the post office. They're serving the less affluent and sophisticated, like Buttress, who still waits to get sick before he seeks treatment. And this is even though the Google medicine boxes are getting cheaper and more widespread every day. And meanwhile, our pal Giles did not live to see Google medicine, which is too bad. He would have loved this, this technology. Scenario D, <clears throat> immortality. Immortality is not as crazy a scenario as it sounds. All it requires is for technology to be advancing faster than your aging. So remember, for 160 years, we've had a quarter of a year increase every year for a very long time. So in principle, all you have to do is, cur is curve that line up a little bit and have a technology advancing such that you have, by a factor of four, made it such that life expectancy is advancing one year for every year you're a you age. And then you're looking at something like immortality for some people. Now, in 2030, John and Anne have too many hard miles on their chassis fully to benefit from immortality. They were born 13 years before the first computer chip. When they were young, the state of the art was the polio vaccine. But who knows for their daughters, Sarah and Emily? And their kids, of course, have never known a world where cancer was anything but manageable. They shake their heads at the histories they read. Scalpels? Poisons? Radiation? How barbaric. What were these people thinking? Thank you very much. <laughs>